a lovely day outside. The weatherman says it's not going to get colder and there's not going to be any moisture. So that's all good news. So I ask you to take this time to gather your mind and your heart in preparation for worship as we listen to John's prelude.
text of reading is Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. For he has founded it on the seas and established it on the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? Those who have clean hands and pure hearts, who do not lift up their souls to what is false and do not swear deceitfully, they will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from the God of their salvation. And our New Testament lesson comes from Matthew 6, verses 26 through 33. Continue to listen for the word of the Lord. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, <clears throat> or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who seek these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> it occurred to me as I was working on this sermon that discipline has multiple meanings. We talk about disciplining children, and that always makes my stomach clench. Because it's not a loving discipline most of the time, and there is a theory of child raising, hopefully long gone, but there has been a theory that if you discipline a child and do so strongly with a stick or with a hand, you will help them grow up to be straight and true. And as the psalmist says, pure in heart, I disagree. So we're not going to talk about that discipline. We're going to talk about the good discipline. The discipline when we teach our children to say please and thank you, it's a habit they have to develop. If you miss worship for two weeks, do you know it's very easy not to come back at all? And those who have missed for two or more weeks have lost the habit or the discipline of worship. I think we would view stewardship differently if we practiced it as a discipline. That would mean we would not have a designated Sunday for stewardship because we'd practice it all the time, every day. We also think of stewardship as being built upon the needs of the church, the bills we need to pay. And that's true. We like to have the lights on. We like to have the heat on. Somebody walked in this morning and said, oh, it's nice and warm in here. Yeah, it is. We hope that we can put a new roof on the fellowship hall. But what if the real foundation of stewardship is gratitude? What if a stewardship mission could be something like this? Our stewardship goal is to help God's people grow in relationship with God by using our God-given time, talents, and finances in grateful service to God. Or how about this one? Our stewardship goals is to create disciples who give generously of our God-given time, talents, and finances to the ministries of Christ's church. Too often, especially in this time of declining membership and churches closing, we think our goal is to increase the number of members. And I've actually heard 
pastors and stewardship committees and membership committees and evangelism committees saying, we need to get more warm bodies in the pew. If we keep the heat on, it'll work. We think our goal is to increase the number of members when we should be focusing on nurturing and building up the faith of disciples. But that doesn't seem very practical. But if we look at disciples, those in the Bible and those we may know in real life, this is the marks of discipleship. Pray daily. And I think, you know, if you get stuck in bad traffic and you're going to be late, you start praying. That works. Study or read scripture daily. I don't know how many of us do that. I had a dear friend who said, <clears throat> Presbyterian pastor, and she said when she became an executive presbyter, she was the executive presbyter of New York City Presbytery, but before that she pastored two tiny little churches in North Dakota, and she said, I miss preaching every week because I had my Bible open every day to prepare for Sunday. And I kind of lost that practice when I became an executive presbyter. Worship with the community weekly. I was just thinking as we passed the piece, um, and, the, and the choir is not singing today, by the way. They have a day off. They have a Sabbath. But I was just thinking, everybody's milling around and talking and talking and talking. And I have to tell you, that's not what the passing of the piece is for. <clears throat> I almost stood up and said, you know, we'll see you in coffee hour. But we miss the community if we don't show up. And how many people see their work, whether it's work in the church or work, work out there where you get a good paycheck and you have some important things to do. Imagine viewing that work, all of that work, as serving in the name of Christ. How would that change your your work, at your business place, or even at your home. This is a tough one. Share your faith story with someone. Oh, Presbyterians, we're so prim and proper, and we're the frozen chosen, and we're not going to tell anybody something personal. What happens if you do? I have another dear friend who's a clergywoman in the Presbyterian Church, and I got to know her when I was working in the national office in women's leadership. And she had learned about the church and about what it meant to be a follower of Christ when she was working on the Roseanne Barr television show in Los Angeles. Seems like a disconnect, but it worked. The woman she worked with, she just admired so much. And one day when they went out for lunch, she asked, she says, I want to be like you. How do you have such patience, such a sense of peace and calm. And her friend said, well, I'm a Christian, and told her her faith story. Well, it just overwhelmed her. And so one day she found herself visiting Fuller Seminary in California and walked around the seminary, and she, she was very funny. She said to me, I don't know how it happened, but by the time I left the seminary, I had my first Bible in my hand and I was registered for classes. Well, she finished her, her degree and did some other things, and the Presbyterian Church had a program at the time um, for such a time as this, and it had to do with very small churches who could not find pastors, especially out in the Midwest, and she became part of that program, and her very first call was a little tiny town in North Dakota on the border with Canada. And she would call me and say, Nancy, the farmers have stopped coming to church. What am I going to do? And I said, it's harvest. It's OK. A couple months later, Nancy, all the men are gone again. They're not in church. I said, it's deer hunting season. And I said, and in the spring, they've got a plant. But before that, they have to pick rocks. 
When I was in high school, all the boys got a free day off of school to go pick rocks, because once the, the ground would thaw up, all the rocks came up to the surface. And every field had a pile of rocks on the co at the corner. And being a city girl from Los Angeles, this was all new for her. All of this happened because somebody shared a faith story with her. And then cultivate a deep relationship with Jesus Christ and others. How do you do that? Well, you do these other things. You pray, you read scripture, you come to worship. And you pay attention because I really do believe that God gives us little glimpses of the presence of God in our lives. And you make a goal of giving generously, not begrudgingly, not the least, but give generously. And not just of your money every week, but of yourself. Stop and really listen to someone. See if someone needs a help. A car ride, a meal, who knows? And we don't tell each other these things we have to be pursued and asked. So pursue and ask. Disciples, rather than members, give a response of gratitude to God. And there is that call that we heard in Genesis to be stewards for all creation. And I wish our translations didn't use that word submit, submissive. That everything is supposed to be submissive to us as human beings. That's not an accurate translation. We're supposed to be stewards of the earth, taking care of it. That dominion language is, is the wrong kind of language for this kind of discipline. And indeed, We have to remember that everything belongs to God. And we have the privilege and the calling to care for it all, including the roof and the lights and the heating. Charles Lane, who's a Lutheran pastor, writes about stewardship in his book. The book title of the book is Ask, Thanks, Tell. And as we try and reshape our thinking about money and stewardship and discipleship and how it all fits together, here's what he writes. He said, let us imagine two people sitting in the pew on a Sunday morning filling out their pledge cards for the financial support of the congregation for the coming year. Joe is sitting there and thinking, how much of my money does the church need this year? How do I feel about how things are going at church these days? Times are tight. Can I really spare any more? And next to Joe is Sue. And Sue is thinking, God has blessed me in so many ways. How do I feel God is asking me to respond to those blessings? Joe is focused on the needs of the church to receive. Sue is focused on the needs of the giver to give. In our passage from Matthew, Jesus redirects our attention from anxieties and worries and points to the promise that God knows what we need and will supply it. For it is the Gentiles who seek all these things, and indeed your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But first, seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. This morning, as we dedicate our gifts, especially our promises for the year ahead, let us dedicate ourselves also to a discipline of gratitude. And this is a transition time, an interim time, and it's been a long time coming. Jeff left in February, and I came on as the bridge pastor, and I was told, oh, two, three months. It's a good thing I like being here. December 1st, my husband and I will start as the interims sharing the position. And hopefully, a year from then, we, you will have a pastoral candidate to vote on, someone that you will sense that God has sent to you, 
someone that has been called by this congregation to serve Christ here with you. What a better way to prepare for that than to have full confidence in God's, God's great providence for us. And to have a sense of who you are, not as just a member of the church, but a disciple of Jesus Christ. If I were that new pastor coming in to serve with you, that would be an exciting and amazing thing to discover about this congregation. So let us dedicate ourselves to a discipline of gratitude. When you open your eyes in the morning, give thanks to God for a new day before you even get out of bed. And when you close your eyes at night, give thanks for the day that you've had, for the good and the not so good, for what you have learned, and for those fleeting glimpses of the presence of God in your life. This discipline of gratitude lays a foundation for true stewardship, far beyond money. Gratitude urges us to be generous. Meister Eckhart, who was a 14th century theologian and mystic, believed the greatest prayer we could make to God is simply, thank you. May we be entering into a lifelong season of stewardship, of generosity and gratitude. It'd be so easy to go home and say, well, stewardship's over, we'll see it next November. It's never over. Stewardship in its deepest meaning of gratitude and generosity means that everything that we do, everything that we say, and how we interact with the world and with each other is based on that stewardship. It's a call to discipleship, and that's the true meaning of discipline. So, may we be entering into that lifelong discipline of stewardship of generosity and gratitude. Thanks be to God. in the affirmation of faith in your bulletin. 
We believe in God, creator of the universe, giver of every good gift, author of life itself. We believe in Jesus Christ, who reminded us of the coming of God's kingdom, who commanded us to care for those in need, who taught us to store up treasures in heaven, not on earth, and who gave us the example of self-giving love. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who inspires us to faithful stewardship of God's gifts, in whom we live and move and have our being, by whom all things are possible. We believe that God has given us gifts to be shared freely and generously in a spirit of love and joy. We acknowledge that we are merely stewards of all that is God's, caretakers of God's home. We believe that faithful stewardship is an act of worship, a means of praising God who has blessed us so abundantly. We believe that God has great things in store for us, for it is in giving that we receive. And you may be seated. A couple of announcements to share. Everything's in the back of the bulletin. But to let you know a few things, we are... Um, the, the deacons are putting together turkey baskets. I don't know what the status is, if they've got enough of everything. Deacon, anybody here? They can always use more. So if you're getting one of those free turkeys from ShopRite and you don't want to use it, bring it to church. Put it in the freezer, right? Okay. Um, believe it or not, Advent and Christmas are coming. And if you would like to be part of our Sunday Advent worship by lighting the candles of the Advent wreath every week, please sign up. There's a sign up in the um, fellowship hall. And I know that Kathleen has already signed up for the first Sunday of Advent, so the pump is primed. You can be number two, number three, or number four. That would be wonderful. Uh, another Advent thing, uh, we are going to have a, a midweek soup and study on Thursdays, and we'll have the soup starting at 5.30, so we can be done at 7 for the choir to rehearse. We're going to talk each week about some of the people who come to the manger, uh, the shepherds, Mary, and the angel. And we'll sing some of your favorite Christmas carols, because during Advent, we don't sing carols in worship. So come sing on Thursday nights and have some great soup. And now I'd like to call on Susan Parson.
Thank you, Susan. When my husband and I did a new church plant in Fargo, North Dakota, which at that time was growing, I mean, there were I don't know how many people moving into the area every month, and it, it is extended far farther south than we ever thought possible. We, our church attracted people who were not, who had had bad experiences with the church. Um, one woman came, and Edie's husband had been very prominent in, in, the, in the state politics and in a variety of things, and he died, and her church said, well, you can't light Advent candles anymore. You don't, you're not a family. <laughs> things like that really painful, hurtful things, and we ended up with a congregation of people who this is their last chance with church. We had a young woman with three children. They lived in a one-bedroom apartment. She had two jobs, and she wrote a check one week for a dollar, and it bounced. And we didn't tell her. We, I remember going to visit her, and she was always happy and upbeat. Her children were happy. And I just remember thinking, she's practicing good stewardship with the gifts she's been given. Most of us can't imagine what that would be like to have a check for a dollar bounce. But it happens. And all we have to do is read Jesus' story of the widow's might, the widow who brings just a few pennies to the offering, and she's mocked and made fun of, and Jesus said she's giving most of what she has or all, of, all that she has. So whatever moves your heart, whatever you feel God is calling you to do and to give, it is most generous and greatly appreciated. Our um, prayer concerns this week include baby Matt, Andrew, and happy fourth anniversary to Karen and Mike Apilla. 43rd, it is. <laughs> oh, hope that didn't change any family dynamics. <laughs> it's okay. My parents were married, and I was born nine months and two weeks later. And so every October on their anniversary, my dad gave my mom a red rose for every year they'd been married. And I would go count the roses, <laughs> make sure they had the right number. But congratulations. For Michelle and Edie, for Carla and Chase, for baby Michelle, Anita, peace for Israel. For Jean Ransom, for Paul Opilla, Tom Coulter, Linda, Edmund, Evelyn and Nancy, Charlie, Joanne, Fred, and Paula Clark's mother-in-law, and I'm sure there are many more. So let us pray. Holy God, you have called us to live lives of discipleship, to be the stewards of your world and of each other in our care and concern for those who are hungry, those who are in despair, those who are lonely, those who live in places of violence, without homes, without clean water. Lord, we understand this is what you call us to do, is to be good stewards and generous disciples. This day we ask for your special care for those that we have named. We rejoice with those who have given us joys, has shared joys with us, and we mourn with those who grieve, and we look for ways to meet the needs of each other and of all your people. So loving God, we are so grateful for the teachings of Christ, for the teachings of your word that help us to see clearly your plan for us and help us to understand what it means to receive faith from you and to have confidence and trust in you. So we do give you thanks. We do say thank you. 
And we do all this in the name of Jesus, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we prepare to come forward with our offerings and our pledge cards, here's an important truth we need to know about faithful stewardship. We give out of gratitude, grateful for what God has already given us, and giving is a new language to many people, including church members. We who we are, the people of God, need to hear for the first time or be reminded of the authentic reasons for giving, not as a legal list, list legalistic rule or a compulsion or a rung on the ladder to sainthood. Giving, the joyful giving of a portion of our resources, empowers transformation. Just like mommy's hugs help when you have to cry. For those of you who are worshiping with us online, please see the back of the bulletin for giving opportunities. Your stewardship pledge can be mailed or brought to the church office. And I invite you to come forward and place your offering and your pledge card in the church. And the ushers will have the plates available for those of you who cannot come forward. <clears throat> 